Amen. Let's look in uh, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Uh, you're opening up there in the bulletin, there's a list of new members uh, that uh, joined uh, this year and also last year. Uh, it's been kind of crazy with COVID and trying to present people and all that. Also, remember our, uh, our annual uh, Christmas cantato, which is a son is given. Uh, there's some flyers out in the foyer that look like this. There's also a basket out there with some uh, little bags, plastic bags, with information to be able to give to people. It'll hang on a door uh, knob, so if you want to take them, take a few of them in your neighborhood, invite some of your neighbors out. Uh, it'd be a great way to get the gospel to them. On the back of uh, the flyer, there's a gospel presentation. And uh, invite people out uh, for our cantata. It's going to be a great cantata and a great message. Bring somebody that's not saved. And uh, they'll hear the gospel message for sure. And uh, also, I remember Christmas Eve, we have our, our Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service. That will be at 6 o'clock. Uh, that week, uh, there's no Wednesday night service. Our midweek service will actually be on Friday night uh, for our candlelight service. And that'll be for that week and also New Year's week. And uh, we'll be having a, a New Year's Eve service here at 6 o'clock uh, on New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve service at 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And so make sure you uh, mark them down that are in, in there. There's also uh, some important dates. Remember our annual church meeting, men's prayer conference, ladies prayer conference, all those things that are coming up. So make a note of that. And we don't want you to miss out on anything. And now... Uh, Enough on announcements. Amen. Let's uh, read Luke chapter 1 in uh, verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation uh, this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And, she, and he shall be great and uh, shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end then said Mary unto the angel how shall this be seeing I know not a man and the angel answered and said unto her the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, and the angel departed from her. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be together. Thank you for this time of the year as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that uh, you loved us so much, you loved this world so much, that you sent your only begotten Son into this world uh, so that we might be able to be saved. And uh, God, uh, we, we do praise the name of Jesus when we think of uh, the reality of spending eternity in hell away from God and tormented. And yet, Lord, we can go into the presence of God in heaven through faith in what Christ did for us on Calvary. And so, Lord, I pray that you just might help us uh, during these next few weeks to glean some biblical truths that will encourage and strengthen us as we become a witness and maintain a testimony in this world that just seems to be so wicked and turned upside down. So bless the preaching of the word of God this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Our text verse is verse 31, and it says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. The promise <coughs> revealed to Mary, a promise revealed. Uh, this is going to be a four-part series that I'm going to be preaching for the month of December. Every, every Sunday I'll be adding another message to it. And uh, the, uh, the series is entitled, He Hath Done Great Things. And I took that out of uh, Luke chapter not 1 in verse 49. It says, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. And so that's our theme for the series. And each message is going to build around that concept and that thought that God is mighty and he had done great things for us. And I think many times we forget the great things that God has done when we deal with so many tragedies, disappointments, difficulties in the world we have a tendency to forget that God is still on the throne and he is still doing great things for us and so the promise revealed here Israel at the time of the writing of the book of Luke was in a great time of turmoil uh, and it was not days of ease and peace in the life of the average Jewish person and uh, Israel was in a time of great turmoil the world literally the world was under the domination of Rome of the Roman Empire and uh, but it was not a pleasant domination because uh, Rome ruled with a rod of iron they were brutal and uh, many suffered under the authoritarian type of approach and oppression in order to force the masses of people to conform to the Roman Empire. So it, oftentimes we read Bible stories and we just think, oh well, it was a nice time during on, on, uh, in people's lives in, at that time, and it wasn't. And so we need to remember that it was a perfect time of commerce and travel because Roman rule, they built many roads and established many trade routes, and, and uh, so commerce was flowing freely uh, but it was with much brutality. The world today seems to be under a siege of fear uh, because of COVID-19. It's like uh, they don't want to stop uh, perpetuating the fear that manipulates people. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you're supposed to get one shot, then two shots, then a booster shot, then another booster shot. And, I don't know how many shots you're supposed to get. I'm not against shots. I'm not, so don't, don't get upset with me. I'm not against shots, and I'm not against people being cared for if they're sick, but where does it end? Uh, where, where do we overcome this oppressive fear that people have uh, because of all this? And, and yet, th that's the way Rome was ruling over Israel at the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's why John would write, even so come Lord Jesus, and I have to agree with him as I deal with things and we see the trends in the world. My cry is, even so come Lord Jesus. I'm ready for the rapture right now. Amen. I like it to happen when I'm preaching because I'll be ahead of you. <laughs> I won't be ahead of the dead in Christ, but the living, at least I am up a little bit. Like, uh, amen. Yeah. <laughs> Even so, come Lord Jesus. In the midst of turmoil, fears and trials and difficulties, we need to remember that God does make promises to us. And he made a promise to Mary. And Mary, tonight I'm going to be preaching a message. I don't want to scare you off. It's a, a, a sequel of this message. Uh, seven promises that were fulfilled in Mary. And uh, so I want you to be here tonight to get the sequel to this message. But anyway, promises reveal. At this moment, in Luke chapter 1, the promise that God has for Mary is being <laughs> revealed to her. And boy, what a great position to be in to have God reveal to us his promises. So let's look at this first of all. I see there was a promise of a miraculous conception. 
And verse 31, he said, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Now, that's not a light statement. Now, we hear the Christmas story every year, and we have plays about her. Kids do plays about it. We read about it. Uh, but just thinking of the situation of this young girl, uh, that it has not been with a man who is pure. And Matthew Latch literally states that, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And this, this girl is hearing a promise from God that is a promise that states that she's going to conceive in her womb. Now, now I don't know about you, I'd have to stop and think for a minute about that one. And uh, the reality is, this is a miraculous conception that's going to take place. And uh, it was based on the fact that she was pure. She was a pure virgin, and God uses her because of that. And I think we often forget that God wants us to be pure. And God blesses those that are pure. And so uh, I lined up some verses starting in Genesis and coming back up to the passage here. In reference to the miraculous conception, why would this promise be revealed to her? First of all, because purity is always opposed. And it starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, and the serpent beguiled Eve. And uh, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God reveals this principle of the opposition to what is pure. He says this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is God talking to the serpent. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the opposition here that was established all the way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve fell into sin God declares to the serpent because he beguiled Eve that there would be an opposition that would take place. There would be the woman who is pure and holy that is going to bring into this world the Savior or the Redeemer of this world. And so she is going to have to deal with the opposition. You know, it's always interesting that, that people oppose things that are holy. You know, it, it, they're ready to embrace that which is corrupt. Yeah. I remember my wife and I, we got saved. I was an alcoholic. I smoked cigarettes and all this that stuff that it did. And we just started living and trying to live a holy, righteous life. I was shocked how many people were mad about it. And, you know, it's, a, it's an it's alarming experience to know that God commands us to be holy, yet when you live holy there's going to be opposition to that. And so here is Mary. She's promised that she was going to have a miraculous conception, uh, but that conception was not going to be uh, uh, just based on non, no conflict or no problems because of the fact that Satan had already been declared that he would oppose what God was going to do in the Messiah in reference to the coming of the Messiah into this world. And so purity is opposed. Uh, does that mean that we say, well, then since people are against being pure, that I'm just going to be corrupt? No. Mary, there certainly was corruption in the Roman rule, and certainly there was corruption in the days in which she lived, but she chose to be pure and holy in her, her demeanor, her testimony, her interaction with others, and as a result of it, God would choose her because of her purity. But understand, it was not without opposition. And so, uh, purity opposed. In Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, we see purity that is promised. In Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so purity promised there would be God's prophets declared that there would be this miraculous conception that would take place uh, because of the fact that the one that was coming into this world had to be totally holy. 
He had to be clean. He, the the, the uh, uh, sickness of, and disease of sin is passed through the man. And uh, uh, But the woman was to be pure and she was to be holy. And the prophets of old promised that there would be that one that God would use. And so this miraculous conception is a promise that is revealed to Mary. He said, you're going to be with a child. It's going to be a miraculous conception. And then in Luke, back in our chapter, we see the purity exercise in verse 34. It says, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So she's confused about it. She's concerned about how this is going to take place because she has lived a holy life. She has been pure in all of her relationships. And now God is revealing to her and promising her that she's going to conceive a child. And she's like, I can't, I, that can't be. Because I have exercised purity. See, it's one thing to say we need to be pure. But it's quite another to live a pure life. Uh, it, is, it is certainly one thing to be able to say that I, I, I have, I'm going to try or I'm going to live my life in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, but it's quite another thing to actually do it. And that's why James says that we're not to be hearers only of the word, but doers of the word also. And so what God commands and what God reveals, then that has to be exercised in our life. And so uh, her purity was exercised. She said, this can't be, this can't happen. How can this happen? I haven't been with a man. And so uh, she is being opposed in her purity in the world that she lives in by Satan. Uh, she has promised prophetically that there would be this one that would be pure and God would use to bring the Son of God into this world. But she's confirming the reality of the exercise of being pure. You know, Jesus warned uh, the disciples and the Pharisees and those that were listening to him. He said, if a man looks on a woman to lust in his heart, he's committed adultery already. And so this matter of purity goes beyond just what we do outwardly, physically in our bodies. It's what's in our thought process and in our minds, uh, whether we're being corrupted uh, by what God declares to be holy and what the devil declares to be unholy. And so at purity exercise. In our chapter, I see that purity is honored. In uh, verse 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And so honored. She's honored. The angel comes and he acknowledges the fact that, wait a minute, you're highly favored because the Lord is, is acknowledging who you are. You know what? We so much worry about what other people think about us. But why don't we think about what does God think about us? In verse 30, notice it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And then in verse 35, it also says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the, the Son of God. So, uh, this matter of a holiness being honored, God honors those who will be pure and those who will be holy. I, I think we need to teach our children uh, how to be pure and how to be holy. Uh, not just in their thoughts, but in their actions. Everything that's going on today in educational circles and this, that, and the other, uh, social media, and you, you name it, is so corrupted and so perverse that somebody ought to stand up and say, no, that is not right. You should not think that way. You should not entertain those thoughts. And you need to be holy because God will honor those who are holy. Amen. But we don't want to do it. We don't want to skirt the issues oftentimes. And uh, people will get nervous when you start getting in certain realms of dealing with these issues. It's always interesting that the world can talk about it in their perverted way. And that's acceptable. 
But when a Christian starts talking about cleanness and purity and honor and trustworthiness, everybody gets nervous about that. And so that takes me back to the first point, purity is opposed, uh, oppressed. And uh, so purity honored. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, I see purity explained. And uh, when we talk about purity, we cannot talk about purity in reference to the defining purpose of the world. We have to look at the defining purpose of God. And I think that's been many, many a problem has developed is that we allow the world to redefine. I preached a message years ago entitled uh, Redefine Terms. And the world is great on redefining everything. They're redefining everything right now. And uh, But anyway, let me get off of that. I'll go crazy here in a minute. In uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Purity explained. Uh, Joseph was an honorable man. He was a just man. And he was concerned about the fact that the woman that he is engaged to, the woman that he is marrying, is now found with child, knowing that they have not been together as a husband and wife. And uh, is concerned about that. But he was not going to humiliate her. He was not going to mock her. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in our school this year, it seems like we have a problem with kids mocking and ridiculing each other. I had to bring a couple boys in the other day because they were making fun of one of the girls' hair. And uh, it's typical, stupid, junior high garbage. Uh, I felt like dealing with it different than I did, but I figured I better had <laughs> But anyway, I, you know, I, I told them, I said, wait a minute, why? why? Why do you want to talk about this girl? Why do you want to make fun of this girl? I was going to say, what, do you like her? You want her to be your girlfriend? <laughs> but I thought, no, their parents would be coming in here after me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so I said, why do you want to do that? When the Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edification. See, the world is just constantly got this mindset of mocking and ridiculing and de downplaying somebody whom you may not like or you may not agree with or there may be a difference. With you. Wait a minute. Purity is being pure in your thoughts and which creates a response that is based upon what God says is right and holy. Amen. Christians, listen, we have, we have allowed ourselves to be corrupted by this world, and we're, we're no longer pure. We think we are because we're not as bad as the world is, but that's not purity in reference to what God declared. Then I see in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, purity applied. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all matter of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy, and so the, the fundamental application of holiness is living in reference to and in light of the character of God. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. Gaining the mind of Christ and responding. And that's what Mary uh, experienced. She had a promise revealed to her of a miraculous conception because she was pure in her thoughts and in her actions. And so God would use her to bring Jesus into this world. I see not only that, but in our text, in Luke chapter 1, in verse 31, in the middle of the verse, I see a divine presentation. Notice it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son. A divine presentation. And uh, knowing this, that she, she was going to bring in the Son of God into this world. I was watching it. 
a clip somebody had sent me on why the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It was about five minutes long. I enjoyed looking at it. I had to keep turning it off every 15 seconds uh, to rebuke the, <laughs> the internet uh, for the wrong answers that he was giving. But anyway, I'd like to just meet the guy one-on-one -on -one and refute everything that he had to say. Uh, but anyway, what he was saying about was they do, one reason they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah because of the fact that God couldn't take on human flesh. Because if he took on heaven, human flesh, he ceased to be uh, infinite and has become finite. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus Christ came into this world, took on human flesh, so that he could die as a sacrifice for our sins, was dead and buried, and rose again because he is infinite. Amen. Amen. And when he talked to the Pharisees, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. And in Revelation, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, Amen. the beginning and the end. Why? Because he is infinite in who he is. And so when this angel talks to Mary and says, uh, you need to realize you're going to conceive in thy womb. Well, what am I going to conceive? You're going to bring forth a son. That's a divine presentation. The revelation of God in John 1.18, John says, no man has seen God, but the only begotten son hath declared him or revealed him. And so the revelation of God is to Mary that you're going to bear a son. You're going to bring forth a son. And when Jesus is born, the declaration is this. Nobody's seen God, but they've seen Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, uh, you know, Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus said this, if you've seen me, it suffice you to see the Father. In other words, I, I and my Father are one in the same. The revelation of God. The Lamb of God, John 1, 29, when she, John was baptizing in Jordan and he, Jesus was coming to him and says, Behold, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That's an acknowledgement of the promise God had made to Abraham when he commanded Abraham to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Uh, Abraham understood that God would provide a lamb. And John sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Divine presentation. Not only revelation of God, the Lamb of God, but the gift of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. I like all these different gimmicks people have. They just came out with this, what was that, Giving, giving Tuesday? Yeah. They were saying something about on the yeah. secular radio, give and get. One day's a give, and then the other day's a get, and all this. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I can't keep up with it. I'll tell you that right now. But I can keep up with this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A divine presentation that God gives to Mary as he reveals his promises to her. Not only the gift of God, but I see the unity of God. And Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And literally in John 10, 30, he is stating that they are literally one and the same. You cannot see the Father unless you see them through the Son. Uh, you, listen, you cannot experience uh, the peace of God that passes all understanding apart from the miraculous divine presentation of the eternal Son of God who was born of Mary as we celebrate Christmas. And then I thought of this, the divine presentation is the way to God. John 14 and verse 6 says, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we have a way to God. A miraculous conception a divine presentation, and then in uh, verse 31 of our text is the eternal salvation. Notice he says, And that, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, that's the miraculous conception, and bring forth a son, that's the divine presentation, and shall call his name Jesus, that's the eternal salvation. 
Why is that? Because uh, Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. <coughs> And so uh, we know this, Matthew one twenty three says, which being interpreted is God with us. And so Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, he is the personification of all that God is. And he came into this world and brought salvation to man because he is Jehovah God. And he is, is in our presence. We can enjoy his presence and because of the fact of the promise that was revealed to Mary. Now, first of all, I see this. The consolation. Uh, consolation. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, uh, we see how uh, Simeon, uh, the priest, as uh, uh, Jesus is brought to the temple. In cha uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, well, if I get over there, I'll be able to do it. It says, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was a just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Yes. Consolation. The word consolation deals with the calling of God. God calls us to peace. He calls us to him through Christ. And listen, Simeon was looking for that consolation that would come, that would bring perfect peace. Why? Because the world was in turmoil. Rome was ruling with a rod of iron. The people of, of Israel were being oppressed and, and murdered. And, and uh, all the turmoil that was going on, Simeon was longing for the consolation of Israel. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9. He's the Prince of Peace. Amen. Consolation. Several definitions ago for consolation. It's a calling near or a summons. So it's the calling of God. Calling us near. God wants us to be. Jesus said, all that come unto me, I will no wise cast out. He said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Consolation is a calling near or a summit. It's a supplication or an entreaty. Jesus Christ said that he was the mediator. There's one God and one a mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He's the consolation. He's, it means exhortation or encouragement. And uh, listen, uh, the greatest encouragement you can experience in your life is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. It means to comfort or to have solace. That means to afford or refresh uh, your soul with the reality that God is near and God is present with you. Uh, it means a messianic salvation. When he said he was looking for the consolation of Israel, he was not just looking for the Messiah. He was looking for the one that would bring peace to the heart of all of Israel. The rabbis called the Messiah the uh, consoler, the comforter. I think it's very significant that Jesus says when he departs from this world, he tells his disciple, I will not leave thee comfortless, Amen. but I will send the comforter that he may abide with thee forever. Why is that? Because he is the consolation of Israel. And because he's the consolation of Israel, he presents the call of God to them. And it, it also, consolation carries with it the meaning of being persuasive. It's a persuasive disc, a discourse. It's a stirring address. In other words, Jesus, you know, when people heard Jesus speak, they said, we never heard it talk this way before. When Jesus would speak, conviction would come on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And so he was the consolation of Israel that brought eternal salvation. And so not only the consolation, but he is the salvation. Luke chapter 2, in verse 30 and 31, Simeon goes on, he says, For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. The salvation of God is the delivering of God. See, God is not just calling us to Jehovah is salvation. 
But God is delivering us by Jesus Christ, who is the God of salvation. Notice in verse 30, in a person, it says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He's talking about looking on the body of Jesus Christ as a baby. He's talking about looking into the eyes of the Savior as he is there to be circumcised. Uh, he's talking about salvation that is in a person. Salvation is not through works. It's not through money. It's not through a nation. It's not through an organization. It's through the person of Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. For my eyes have seen thy salvation in a person. And it's to all people. Notice in verse 31, Luke 22, uh, Luke 2, 20, uh, 31. Whatever it is, find it. Amen. <laughs> Which thou hast prepared for the, before the face of all people. I am so thankful that God included me in uh, calling me to salvation. I'm glad that God's not willing that any should perish. And I'm glad that eternal salvation is based upon the promise that was revealed to Mary. Uh, that this one that was going to be born of her... Uh, was the one who was being called Jesus Christ, uh, the eternal salvation of God. So I see the consolation, I see the salvation. And then in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, I see the redemption. Redemption. Uh, this is Anna speaking in the temple, and she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption of Israel. So that's the redemption that is the purchasing of God. Don't you ever forget that you just didn't walk into salvation. Right. God purchased your salvation. Amen. God paid the debt of your soul. <laughs> God paid the, the, um, uh, that which was necessary to satisfy his holiness and his purity by demanding that there be a sacrifice that was a blood sacrifice, and that sacrifice was his own son, Jesus Christ. And so we see this promise revealed is a miraculous conception, a divine presentation, and eternal salvation. Now, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, Jesus said this, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now, Israel was looking for the one who was coming. They were looking for their Messiah, but they weren't ready when he came. And uh, Jesus, as he departs from this world and sends letters to the churches in this world, reminds them, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And Jesus Christ is coming again. That was one of the things that fellow, Jewish fellow said. He said, there's nothing in Scripture that says that the Messiah would come and die and that would come back again. We don't believe in the second coming. Well, Jesus Christ said, behold, I come quickly. In chapter 22, verse 7, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecies of this book. In chapter 22 and verse 12, it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works. In chapter 22 and verse 20, He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. I mean, you can't see Christ stating those statements so many times through in the book of Revelation and think that we have plenty of time to do as we please. No, he's coming quickly. He's made a promise to us. He made a promise to Mary and he fulfilled it. He revealed it and fulfilled it. He's made a promise to us. His promise is that he's not willing that any should perish. You're here today, you're not sure you're saved. I want you to know you can be saved today. You're watching live stream. You can be saved today. But know beyond that, as believers in Christ, we live our life in the realm of the sureness that what God says he'll do, he'll do. Amen. We don't doubt it. We don't debate it. We don't reject it. We don't go against it. 
we receive it, we rejoice in it, we acknowledge it, Amen. and we live in the reality of the deliverance of an almighty God. Why? Because promises of God are revealed. Let's pray. My Father, I come to you. I thank you so much. I thank you for Mary and the way you used her, Lord, her testimony, the grace of God that was upon her, Lord, the sweetness and the purity in her life and her testimony of uh, not just her life, but Joseph's life and the life of Christ and the salvation that was brought to us. God, we, we are thankful that your promises are sure. We're thankful that your promises are revealed. We're thankful, oh God, that your promises are fulfilled in our lives each and every day. And so I pray, Lord, if there's someone here not saved, I pray they might come and receive Christ as their Savior this morning. I would pray, Lord, that for every one of us that have been saved, that this Christmas season will be the most exciting time of the year for us. Uh, we'll take the, every opportunity that we have to tell others about Jesus Christ. And Lord, in a world that is in such a state of fear and turmoil, God, we know there is hope and there is peace through Jesus Christ. And so bless us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Uh, have you any room for Jesus as we're singing? Why don't you come and pray if the Lord's laid something on your heart? You're not sure you're saved. Come, we'll show you from the Bible how to be saved. Uh, God is gracious to us, and what God has so stated will come to pass as he has declared. Amen. You come and lead us in song. <coughs> salvation and Lord I would just pray that this time of the year that we would look for every opportunity Lord to share the glorious message the promise that was fulfilled in, in you and Lord that we would have opportunities this week today to just share the gospel message maybe just to invite someone to church but Lord to tell them about a savior who came to this earth and died for them that they might have eternal life so, Lord, we thank you for all you've done. We pray that you bring us back this evening, ready to hear from you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.